Good morning, everybody. And uh, we are now live from Augusta, Georgia. I know that um, there's many of you now following us and ready to initiate this, this webinar that we have for you today in the morning. And uh, we will be discussing tips, some tips and tricks for, uh, for your portion veneer preparations and your portion veneer bonding protocols as well. Uh, I do want to give you some uh, some reminders. Uh, we will be answering some questions towards the end of our presentation. So please, uh, if you find yourself in your screen and you go to the lower right side, you'll see there's a dialog box where there is a Q&A a box that you can uh, upload your questions. You just put your questions in there and I'll be more than happy at the end of my presentation to read some of these questions and share with you my thoughts and uh and you know give you any advice or any extra tip that i may need to have to do that um i do want you to visit our, uh, our web page as well i want you to uh, visit our web page there is a tab as you can see on the screen called webinars and all our webinars all our future webinars are going to be listed there with the link so that you can always uh, be on top of any topic that we have or any topic that may be of interest for you so make sure that you visit our webpage and that you click on the webinar. Starting our next webinar, we're going to be um, we're going to be providing some continuing education credits towards uh, through the Academy of General Dentistry as well. So please visit our webpage and subscribe. So let's start with our with our presentation for today in the morning, and we're going to start with our first tip and trick related to porcelain veneers. Now. The first thing that I want to do before I start talking about this tip is I want to just share with you two articles that I think that are very important for us to understand and that will really help us um, kind of assess ourselves or assess our cases before we decide to restore this, this particular case with a with porcelain veneers. And two things that we have to understand is that the number, the, the, the first one being that when you uh, prepare teeth for porcelain veneers, you really want to have a lot of enamel left behind because many studies have shown that the more enamel you have, the more success, uh, the better survival rate that these porcelain veneers will have. So keep that in mind because uh, what I'm going to share with you today is a, you know, one tip for sure on how to control your debt preparation so that you try to avoid getting or going beyond enamel. And, and again, this is not that easy. This is easier said than done. And I'll show you why, but it's very important that we understand that uh, the more enamel we have uh, in our preparations, the better off we're going to be. And this is another study that has shown the opposite, meaning that if you have dentin exposed or the more dentin you have, the weaker the bond is. So the more dentin you have, the less uh, survival rate that you will be having. So both of these studies that I have shared with you are just looking at the same thing from a different perspective. The one being enamel is important. The second one being dentin can create problems. So if you have to uh, decide, or if you have to, if you have a case where you're gonna need to have some dentin exposed, always try to maintain peripheral enamel on your preparations, which is really gonna help you uh, sustain that bonding efficacy that you're gonna need to maintain these restorations in place. Because we all know they're all just bonded restorations there's no retentive features in keeping these restorations in place. So again, I said it at the beginning, it, this is easier said than done. And yes, we, all, we want all our, our margins on enamel, but the, the, the key element to understand is that when you look at this, at this section, cross section of a tooth, and you look at the different thicknesses of enamel, when you go to the gingival portion, you can see that we only have 0 0.28 to 0 0.31 millimeters of enamel. So we have a very, very thin layer of enamel in this portion of the tooth. And this is one of the things that makes it very difficult for us to try to maintain all enamel preparations. So, uh, you know, we have to understand that there are other uh, aids, there are other treatments that we can actually uh, use to improve color or the, yeah, the color of the substrate of our, of our teeth so that we have less uh, aggressive preparations needed to be done. Because we all know that if you want to increase value, if you want to modify the shade of a tooth by using veneers, you're going to have to prepare more the tooth. So if you use, for instance, if you bleach your patient's teeth prior to you preparing uh, the, the, her, his or her teeth for porcelain veneers, 
because you have increased uh, or you have improved the color up of the substrate, you're going to be able to reduce or to prepare less your enamel, reduce less enamel, and, and at the same time, increase the survival rate of your restorations. So keep that in mind. You know, you have very little enamel on gingival third. You have a little bit more enamel uh, on the middle third. You have a lot more enamel on the incisal third. But if you look at the figure, you can see that you don't have more than one millimeter. So your preparation has to always be less than a millimeter and, 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 and I would say less than half of a millimeter on the gingival third of the tooth. Uh, to, to stay in enamel and to give, and to give your restorations, again, this, this increased survival rate. Now, let's go to trick, trick, tip and trick number two. We already know that uh, we have to be in enamel. We already know that we want to have the least amount of dentin exposed in our preparations. So the question now is, how do we really, con how can we control this, the, the depth of our preparation? How can we, um, you know, make this happen in a way that is predictable? And in 2013, uh, Ed McLaren came out with this, what, what he calls the bonded functional aesthetic prototype. And the idea behind the bonded functional aesthetic prototype is that at this point in time, everybody, you know, we were all doing mock-ups, we were waxing our cases, we were making PVS impressions of our wax up. We were using um, some bisacryl in our, in our chair side, and we would put this in the patient's mouth and kind of get a, you know, a glance of what my final restorations will look like. And the patient was able to view this in a mirror. He was, he was able to smile, to talk to you, to kind of function with this, with this mock-up in his mouth. But then shortly after the patient would leave our office, we would remove the mock-up and then he would go home. So there was really no functional value. There was no way that we can test this long-term uh, in the patient's mouth. So the difference between a mock-up and a bonded functional aesthetic prototype is that they both are gonna be, they're both gonna enhance aesthetically the, immediately the smile of our patients. But the bonded functional prototype, patient is gonna be able to take it home. He's gonna be able to function with it. He's, he or she is going to be able to give you comments, feedback. Do I want my teeth to be longer? Do I want them to be shorter? You're going to be able to observe if these are going to fracture, if he's going to be hitting on one, uh, you know, on the length and, or the new length of the incisal edges. All these other things that are so important for you to know, you're going to be able to test drive these in your prototypes. So one of the, one of the greatest functions of the prototype is that patient takes it, takes it home with them and he, he or she is going to be able to evaluate and you are going to be able to evaluate, you know, 15 or 30 days later, how are these, how are these changes that I'm proposing to my patients are affecting the mathematic system, if at all. So that's where I see this being a very important. Now, what are the steps for you to create a, a bonded prototype? Well, normally we have to have a wax. -up. So I'm sharing with you here a case and I am going to do, I'm, I'm planning on this particular patient to do four portion veneers, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So the first thing I want to do is I want to add wax and I want to see if that new facial contour is kept within the right, the, the correct confines of the facial contours of the canines and other teeth of my patient. So I want a smooth arch and I want to make sure that I don't have any uh, excess or any over contours of these, of, of my wax. So once I know that I'm able to, uh, and, 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 you know, by all means, if you need to reduce the stone to, in order for you to be able to strain this out, that's what you got to do. And that's when you, that's, that's when your treatment plan or your clinical protocol is really coming, coming, coming alive, because now you know where you're going to need more reduction, where you're going to need less reduction, where you're going to need no reduction. If you look at this wax up, you can see that the gray is, is very visible and you can barely see some areas where you can, where you can see the stone showing through the wax, through the gray wax. Well, those areas where you see the stone through the gray wax are the areas that most likely are going to need more reduction in order for me to achieve this result on my patient. So now you're seeing the other potential of the bonded prototype. Not only I'm going to get function with it and I'm going to get functional answers, but now I can use this as my preparation guide. And as we just said a couple of uh, minutes ago, the, the control of that preparation is crucial for the survival rate of your restorations. So once we have this prototype, we're going to now make an impression of our wax up. We're going to make an impression of our wax up uh, with using clear PVS. And I normally fabricate a tray. And you can see that there's a triad tray here that I fabricated specifically for this patient. I inject the clear PVS within the tray, and then I go ahead and make an impression of the wax up. And I always try to extend my impression to other teeth 
so that I get a positive seeding of this impression tray and impression material within the patient's mouth. The most important thing that I want you to see in this photo and that is crucial for you to understand is that when you're doing your wax up, either you or your lab or somebody in your office is doing the wax ups, you want to make sure that you come back and you remove and you create very nice facial and lingual embrasures. Because what this is going to do for you is that it's going to allow you to do very little removal of excess within the patient's mouth once you deliver the prototype. So it's very important that you take the time if your lab, if your lab is doing the wax up, just take the time to look at your wax up, make sure that you're happy with it. If you have to make any alterations, if you have to, you know, improve the, the, the facial lingual embrasures, this is the time for you to carve them correctly so that when you make your impression, you have all those details within your impression. And again, this is going to facilitate the elimination of excess during your clinical steps in the patient's mouth. And that's what I'm going to share with you now. This is the same patient. So I obtained a, 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 an impression of this. I did my wax up that you just saw. Now this is the clinical day. So now I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and create my, you know, deliver my prototype. The only thing I'm gonna do, and this is the other nice thing about the prototype, is that I don't have to do any tooth preparation. In this particular case, if you look at six and 11, if you look at both of the canines, you can see how facially, you, know, you can see the facial contours of the canine in relationship with the laterals and the centrals. And you can see that both laterals and, and the centrals are slightly more lingual to the facial aspect of the canines. So I can visualize in this photo that this is, a, this is gonna be an additive case. This is a case where I'm gonna do very minimal reduction because I have to add volume to these teeth and add volume in approximately so that I can close and manage the diastemas. So that being said, I really don't need to remove anything. I, I don't need to prep the teeth when I'm doing my prototypes. All I have to do is make sure that I get rid of the stains, that I get rid of any unsupported enamel, and then I go ahead, spot edge, prime and bond, and I'm gonna deliver my prototype. So this is now my bonded functional aesthetic prototype. This is, I done this with flowable composite that I have injected in the intaglio surface of that clear PVS, and then I sit directly onto the patient's mouth. All these teeth are bonded together at this point. Seven, eight, nine, and 10 are just one solid structure of flowable composite throughout the anterior aspect of my patient's mouth. You can see that there's very little flash. I have not removed any excess yet. I'm just showing you immediately after I have light cured this prototype within my patient's mouth. And as you can see, there's very little flash. There's a lot of detail in between each tooth. So there's very, very detailed facial embrasures that will allow me to now go ahead and remove just a little bit of the excess, a little bit of the flash, and now start testing this prototype. Well, one thing that I do want to mention that I think is, is nice about the prototype as well is that I do this without any anesthetic. So this is the, the, uh, directly delivered to my patient's mouth. I don't use any anesthetic. So now I can immediately evaluate patient's smile, patient's phonetics. I can have a conversation with him or her, and I can take some photos without any problems. So now I've used a very, very small and fine diamond burr. I actually use a mosquito burr for this. And I just go around every, uh, uh, you know, the gingival contours of my prototype just to remove that flash. I go ahead and I open a little bit the embrasures just so that I can make sure that my patient can use a soft pick to clean in between these prototypes. Again, because they're all bonded together. And then I just polish. Them. Once I'm, I polish them, now I start immediately after that. And this takes me 15 to 20 minutes. Immediately after that, I'm ready now to evaluate my patient's smile, her phonetics, and you can see the immediate improvement. So not only this uh, serves as a mock-up, my patient can actually see what I'm trying to offer. My patient can actually evaluate aesthetically how the new smile or the new uh, contours of her teeth, the new volume on her teeth, how would they uh, uh, be seen in her, in, her smile, in her smile directly. But at the same time, I'm able to have her smile, to have a conversation with her. I can adjust the occlusion. I can make, you know, ask her, do you feel, does it feel weird to have your centers a little bit longer? Does it interfere with your speech? Does it bother your lower lip? All these questions, all these functional questions can be asked and can be altered again, if I need to immediately in that appointment. And then I just send my patient home. And normally I send them home for 15 uh, to 30 minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 15 to 30 days. And, you know, just have them evaluate, have other people in their household you know, give them any feedback on the aesthetic part on, uh, of, the, of the new teeth, but they are motivated. They're motivated because now they have a very nice interim restoration that they can use to evaluate and to give me feedback 15 or 30 days later. So 
now that we have discussed tip number two, and it makes, you know, now I know that I've, with tip number two, with creating a prototype, I have now my ideal contours, facial and incisal contours, incisal length as well, uh, of, my, of my new teeth. Now I'm going to take you to tip number three. Again, all of this has to do with that first tip where we said depth control of my preparations is crucial to the survival rate of my porcelain veneers. Keep that in mind. So now I'm going to talk about preparations because how do I use now my prototype? Forget about the functional aspect, forget about the aesthetic uh, uh, evaluation of my patient, but how can I use my prototypes for my preparations? How can I use them to help me control the amount of enamel or tooth reduction that I need for this specific case? And this is the beauty of this technique. This technique allows you to individualize every single patient. Every single patient is going to be different depending on what their aesthetic demands are, depending on the location of the teeth, depending on the conditions of the teeth, they're all going to be different. So this prototype is going to help you individualize your treatment plans accordingly based out of how your patients, your patients present to your clinic. So the one thing that I want you to do, that I want you to understand is that you need, uh, you know, you need these birds, you need a, a kit that can help you, uh, uh, you know, prep teeth in a, in a way that is predictable. And what I like about this preparation kit that I'm sharing with you right now is, is the, the, the wheel barrel, the wheel uh, the, or the depth cutting bird that comes within the kit. Now these cutting birds can be 0.3 millimeters, can be 0.5 millimeters, can be 0.7 millimeters, can be 1.0 millimeters. So you have different uh, diameters so that you can, you can control, you have different options for depth preparations. I like using the 0.3 and the reason why I like using the 0.3 basically in all my preparations is because again, my goal, don't forget that in the gingival aspect is where you have less than, you have up to 0 0.32 millimeters of enamel. So you're in that, you're less than half of a millimeter. That's the critical area where you don't want to be exposing dentin because if you do, chances of you getting staining of your veneers on that margins are going to be very high. So always keep in mind that the most important aspect of enamel, if you're going to have some dentin exposed, is that you want to have peripheral enamel, gingival, mesial, distal, and incisal. You want to make sure that on the periphery, you have enamel. So because of that, I like using the 0 0.3 millimeter burst so that I have better control. And again, I try to do all measures, all preclinical measures, bleaching, microabrasion, resin infiltration, anything I need to do to eliminate white spots, to improve color of teeth, so that I have a better substrate that I can use and, be, and if I do have a better color uh, or underlying color, I'm going to be able to reduce more. So always uh, use a, 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 you know, specially designed kits for your veneer preps. This particular kit has uh, both preparation burrs, the 856L and the 856-016 that you see on the screen. Both of those are, are, are the same diameter, same shape and size of burr, but with two different grits. And what I like about that is I do my gross reduction with the green uh, marked uh, uh, or labeled burr, which has a, has a, it's more coarse. And then I go and do my final reduction and my, my finishing of the reduction with the red stripe burr, which has a very fine diamond grit. And that will allow you to have a very nice and smooth preparation. And I will show you that shortly. So one of the things that I want you to know is that Galib Gurel was the, uh, the clinician or the academician that came out with the technique of using these prototypes and cutting through the prototypes or through the mock-ups, uh, you know, the, your, depth, your depth cutting uh, uh, guides so that then you can reduce them before removing the mock-up or the prototype. In this particular case, as I said at the beginning, I don't use a mock-up, I use my prototypes. I always fabricate prototypes for my patients. I send them home with the prototypes for at least 15 days. When they come back, I do my death cutting burrs or my death cutting guides, I'm sorry, through the prototype. I mark them as you see on the photo. And then all I got to do now is use that coarse diamond bird that I just showed you and make all these three depth cutting guides come together. And this is what you're going to, you know, one important thing that you have to understand is that there are, there has been authors out there and there's been research comparing this type of reduction, this controlled environment, the controlled type of reduction versus a free-handed reduction. And what the research has shown is that in 15 to 22% of the times when you use free-handed reduction, you're going to over-reduce and you're going to have dentin exposure. And again, remember what I said at the beginning, having, having the more dentin you have, the greater risk of 
flexure and fractures and the bonding of your, of your restoration. So keep that in mind. So again, after I have make all these uh, depth cutting guides come together, I've removed my prototype and this is what you see. You can see that I have barely reduced or touched my enamel in some areas. Now I know that I have more reduction to do. I know that I want to add length to these teeth. I want to modify the incisor ledge position. So I'm going to have to reduce one millimeter of the incisor ledge. I'm going to have to reduce, you know, the facial. I'm going to have to give my lab a finish line. I'm going to have to go in approximately because I want to make sure that I close all the diastemas and I, and I manage my gingival contours, my gingival embrasures. But if you go from this and these are my final preparations, you can see that I still have a lot of enamel on my preparations. Barely have a little bit of dena in approximately on number on tooth number nine. Everything else is all enamel. You have a very nice and well-defined chamfer margin, very small chamfer. Um, again, just enough for the lab to say this is where the preparations end. They're all super gingival because I'm not modifying the color of the teeth. This patient went through bleaching for 30 days prior to me preparing and doing all the other clinical steps that you're seeing. So I have improved. The, uh, her, the, the color of her teeth. So all I'm going to do now is just do my minimal preparation uh, so that I can just restore these teeth without any need uh, whatsoever to change or modify any shade of her teeth. And that's the most important aspect of it. So this is now when my tip and trick number four come in. So now I have very nice and conservative preparations. And every time that I'm lecturing out there, I get a lot of young and, 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 and middle-aged dentists approach me saying, hey, you know, one of the issues that I'm having when I'm, when I'm doing my veneer preparations is my temporaries. You know, how, how do you get, how do you, you fabricate a set of temporaries that, are, that, that can last, you know, the, the time that, that you need for the lab to give you back your restorations that are aesthetically pleasing and that, are, that can stay in the, in the patient's mouth for a good bit of time. So there's many ways that you can do temporization of your veneers, but I'm going to show you the way that I do it. And again, I'm going to use my wax up, my initial wax up for this. So with that initial wax up, you already saw me creating that clear PBS impression that I use for my bonded functional aesthetic prototype. Well, right after I make that impression, I take a new impression using, uh, um, uh, using uh, 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 a putty matrix type of PBS material. And in order for me to fabricate my, my uh, temporaries, I'm going to use bisacryl. So these are the two things that you want to have. Now, this is my impression of the wax up with my putty matrix and a light body, light material within the putty matrix. Now, I do this in two separate steps. First, I fabricate, I make an impression with no tray. I make an impression, a roundhouse impression, you know, extending, I don't know, a couple of teeth distal to the area that I'm going to be working on. And I make a very nice impression of my wax up, keeping a very nice and thick PVS facially and lingually to the wax up. So when I say thick, I want you to think about having at least five millimeters thick in this particular case, because these are veneers, that's where I'm gonna, I'm gonna need that extra thickness. You want this to be rigid. You don't want it to be flexible because you don't wanna move it in the patient's mouth. You want it to stay stable so that you can, uh, so that the material can set and do not alter or modify the shape or the form of the, the, the teeth that you've waxed up. So you want those five millimeters facially. You want to make sure that once this, this uh, putty matrix sets, you remove it from your wax up. And I want to give you another tip here that I always add a little bit of Vaseline to my wax up because I don't want the, the wax up to, sometimes I have noticed that if you don't do that, you can have some of the wax stick in, in the integral surface of your, of your putty matrix. And you don't want to damage your wax up because you want to make now a second impression of that wax up using the light material that you see here in blue so that now I can copy all the details. So I make a first impression with a, with a putty matrix. I remove the putty matrix. I inject a light material within the putty matrix and on my wax up. And then I set them both together again and let, and let the, the light body set completely. Once this sets, I remove it and I have this very nice and detailed impression that now I'm going to go ahead and using a, a, a Bar Parker blade, a 25 blade, I'm going to cut right in between the embrasures. And the idea of this is that by cutting these notches right at the embrasure location, when you see this, this putty matrix in the patient's mouth and you get excess, you're going to have all the excess flowing through those vents that you've created, very easy to remove, which will leave you with very, very little excess and very little trimming to do after that. And this is important, and I'll, and I'll share with you why shortly, but this is very, these vents are very, very important. 
And the other thing that I do is I want to make sure that every, you know, that I follow all the roundness of the gingival contours, just to make sure that it's easy for me to access any excess that I have. And this is immediately after I delivered. Now, I, I will share with you a slide on all the clinical steps, but what I want you to see here is that this is exactly the same uh, uh, prototype. This looks a lot like my prototype. This came directly out of my wax up using the technique that I just shared with you. And the most important thing is that this temporary that you see there, what I, I spot etched the tooth. I apply a little bit of adhesive on top of the spot edge. I put my bisacryl in with my, with, my, uh, with my putty matrix. I seat it in the patient's mouth. I wait 30 seconds, remove any excess, and then I wait the full two and a half minutes, remove the putty matrix, and now my, my, my uh, temporaries are bonded to the teeth. They never come out. All I have to do after that is go in and just with a very small mosquito bird, just go in into the embrasure area, make sure that I open them just a little bit or just enough for my patient to use a soft pick and be able to clean around that area. So I never remove my temporaries once I do these. They are literally bonded directly onto the teeth. And obviously in this particular case, because I have interproximal preparations, they're locked in place. So for me to remove these, I'm going to have to break them the day of delivery. So, uh, but the good thing is that I still have my, 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 uh, my putty matrix just in case I need to redo them. So this is a slide where you see a lot of wording, but I'm just going to walk you through the process just to make sure that we have all the steps in order for me to go from point A to point B with my, with my temporaries. So again, like I said, you know, teeth are nice and dry. I spot edge one to two millimeter diameter. I'm going to apply a little bit of adhesive just on that etched surface, that little spot that I just recently etched. I'm going to make sure that that's a very nice and thin layer of adhesive. And I'm going to go ahead and like here for 10 to 15 seconds, each little spot. Then I'm going to inject the bisacryl in the integral surface of my putty matrix. I'm going to wait, I'm going to seat it on the patient's mouth, wait 20 to 30 seconds, remove the excess through those vents that I just showed you that I created, wait a full two minutes for the bisacryl to fully set, remove the putty matrix, polish the margins using any, any type of disc system that you have in your office, make sure that you open your embrasures with the mosquito burr, polish the facial using disc and points, make sure that everything is nice and polished, make sure that you check the occlusion, you check protrusive canine guidance, for no interferences and you're ready to send your patient home and now you have everything you need you have the prototype this is actually the, a small photo of the temporaries in the patient's mouth and and you know you have everything you need now you just have to send it to the lab you selected your shade you know that the lab needs to do what they need to do and you're ready then to come back you know maybe 15 days later and this is when tip and trick number five come into play because now you have your veneers you're going to go ahead and bond the veneers and the bonding of the veneers Again, when you have full enamel, like the, this case that I'm sharing with you, I'm going to deliver three portion veneers here. Look at the amount of enamel that I had following these techniques. I use a, 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 a putty matrix. I mean, I'm sorry, a wax up. I, I do my bonded prototype and then I cut through the prototype and this is what I get. 100% full enamel on seven, eight and nine. And now I'm ready to bond. And the, the most important thing that I want to share with you for the bonding is because you have enamel, you can use a total edge technique where we all know, which we all know is very, very predictable. So we're gonna you know, totally edge, and I wanna use a very thick uh, etchant for this. And that's very important that you understand you don't want runny etchants because you don't, want to, you don't want to etch neighboring teeth. You just wanna make sure that you concentrate your etching on the teeth that you're gonna restore. So I'm gonna go ahead and bond all three veneers at the same time. This is the most important aspect of this tip. When you're gonna select your adhesive, make sure that you have a very thin adhesive. And not only that the adhesive has a very low film thickness, but when you apply the adhesive, what I normally do is I go ahead and I use a one micro brush to apply two to three coats of the adhesive on every tooth that I'm going, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm going to bond to. Once I've done that and I've saturated the area, and I've, you know, I've made sure that I have enough of, uh, adhesive on, on, on this enamel, on this etch enamel, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a new micro brush that is dry and I'm gonna start removing the excess of my bonding agent on all the margins and the facial aspect of my preparations. And I use two or three of those micro brushes to make sure that I actually dry them on my patient's bib to make sure that it, how much are they absorbing. And you will see that that first micro brush, that first dry micro brush, you're gonna see a lot of the adhesive pooling in the patient's uh, bib. 
because it absorbed a lot of the adhesive, a lot of the excess adhesive that you had. But when you use a second or a third microbrush and you put it on the bib, you'll see that there's nothing more coming out of the, the, the microbrush. There's no more um, adhesive drying in the bib or being absorbed by the bib. And what does that tell you? It tells you that now you have, you remove all the excess, you have a very, very film, uh, low film thickness, and now you're ready to, to, to light cure. Because I, oh, I, I do want to light cure personally. I prefer light curing my adhesive at this point and then bonding my veneers. But for this to happen without any, uh, any issues, you want to make sure that you don't have any pooling of your adhesive uh, um, uh, on, these, on your preparations prior to you light curing and then bonding the restoration. That's my fully seated, all seven, eight, nine, fully seated, three portion veneers on the teeth. I've removed the excess. I'm gonna go ahead and now remove the cords and make sure that I remove all the excess and, and, and get to my final, my final restoration. So this is very important, again, uh, because we, what we wanna do is that we wanna try uh, to minimize any, any issues while we are uh, in, the, in, in that bonding process which we want to make sure that these restorations sit fully sit before we go ahead and light cure the cement. And when you're going to light cure, when you have to make sure that you use a light cure resin cement. That's what I recommend for veneers. You don't want anything that can dual cure because you want to make sure that the veneer is correctly seated before you go ahead and um, and finish your restorations. So uh, with this, with this, uh, this is my final slide. So with this, I think that we're. We're, we've covered the five tips and tricks that I wanted to share with you today that I think that are, that are, that are important. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. I don't, I'm, I'm opening the question dialogue box. I don't see any questions there, uh, but I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna give you a couple of, uh, there's one right there. So if the patient bleaches before the veneers are done, will the teeth change color over time and affect the veneer results? Can you bleach teeth with veneers on them? Will it break down the bond? Well, that's a really, really good uh, question. And, 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 and the, the, you know, to answer your question is, number one, you want to bleach before. Number two, if there may be some changes in the, in the, in the shade of the, uh, uh, you know, the color of, of the actual substrate. So if your veneers are very, very thin, like the ones that I'm sharing with you today, yes, you are going to, if you have color changes on the substrate, you, that will affect the final outcome or, or, the, or some color changes on the veneers. Can you bleach again? Yes, you can, because you on the lingual surface, you have tooth structure. So what you need to do is make sure that you use the 10% carbon peroxide, make sure that the patient applies the bleaching gel on the lingual surface of the bleaching tray. And with that, you shouldn't have any problems and this should not break down your bonding whatsoever. So thank you very much for that question. Uh, there's another question here. Um, what code do you use for bonded functional aesthetic prototype? And that's, that's a really good question. Uh, I use, I code my prototypes as a protective restoration. So there's a code called protective restoration uh, in, the, in the CDT codes, and that's the one that I use. Uh, um, and, and this code, uh, and, and it has, the reason why I use it is because I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an interim restoration, number one. This code has a, 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 very, a fairly low fee associated with it. And I really don't want to over, overcharge my patient for a prototype for something that I'm going to use just for 15 or 30 days. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove. To be honest with you, if you think about it, the, the person that's, that's benefiting the most out of the prototype is the dentist because now you have everything under control. Yeah, your patient gets some answers. They can see, you know, they can see a, a immediate improvement of their smile, but you're the one that's really getting all the help from this prototype because you're the one that has been able to calibrate your preparations, been able to make sure that you have uh, the majority of your preparations is in enamel so that you have a longer survival rate for your restoration. So yes, all these excellent questions. I hope that, uh, that everybody enjoyed uh, our presentation today. And again, I, um, I recommend that you go to our webpage, visit our webpage, RomeroDentalSeminars.com and go to webinars because when you click on webinars, you will see, you will find a list of future webinars that you may find interest in and it's easy for you to just sign in directly through our webpage. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, for, for sharing this time with us this Saturday morning. And I hope to be, you know, share some more inf information with you soon and shortly and see you in these webinars. Thank you very much for your time.